Remember to talk to your doctor to see if videos of flashing lights and fast-moving images are all right for you. This program contains mature subject matter such as fictitious gun violence and sexual harassment of minors. Viewer discretion is advised. Into the madness. Hello everyone, Complete Indy here, and welcome. On today's programming, I'd like to take some time to talk about the innovative, nostalgic, and widely popular internet subgenre of analog horror. So sit back, relax, grab your snacks, and enjoy. There's a very special show coming up. Slim down this summer. Allow me to set the stage. For many people who grew up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even myself in the early 2000s, they grew up on VHS cassettes. And they were everywhere. Everything from episodes of children's entertainment to popular family-friendly movies to high-action blockbusters were produced in this format. And for the time, it was plenty enough, and an entire generation of people grew up on them, myself included. As time went on, however, this technology was replaced by compact discs, DVDs, which were both able to store more information and were produced for a fraction of the cost. As such, the way of the VHS was phased out, slowly collecting dust. And then, found footage rose to popularity. Found footage as a genre was probably first popularized by The Blair Witch Project, a 1999 supernatural horror film created by independent producers Daniel Myrick and Arado Sanchez. This film purported itself to be recovered from the camcorder of three young filmmakers who had gone missing a year prior, and it was the start of a trend. This found footage format of entertainment, the idea that you're watching something that was caught on film, maybe even by fluke, took a small subsect of horror fans by storm. Then, in 2009, Stephen Chamberlain's No Fru Road was published, and it ignited a lot of people's interest. Many popular creepypastas, uh, short horror stories often about perverting some trivial thing, many of which are popular today like Slenderman, Sonic.exe, and Ben Drowned, worked on the idea of found footage instead being a survivor's recounting of a series of events, and Chris Straub's Candle Cove was a pretty decent hit, showcasing a group of forum users talking about this creepy, surreal, and terrifying children's program from their youth. And Candle Cove is arguably the most important name on this list, not for the media itself, although it did get its own TV show, no. Rather, its creator, Chris Straub, an American cartoonist, writer, podcast host, stage performer, and creator of Local 58. This web series starred in 2015 focused on a public access television network, a type of TV network that most cities and communities had for their own very localized programming. In the pilot episode, a weather advisory is given to the citizens of the greater Mason County area, warning them of a meteorological event that they should not observe. To stay inside, lock their doors, lock their windows. Things go sideways pretty quickly, and they flip upside down even faster as we cut to the moon in all its lunar glory with the citizens of the greater Mason County screaming beneath it. This was the first of many episodes in Local 58's run. And not too long in, in Local 58's shortest episode station ID, what was supposed to be just an identifier for that one channel would go on to identify the genre as a whole. Analog horror at 476 megahertz. Local 58 is, as of this being written, not complete yet, but it tells a story involving the moon being some supernatural entity, terrifying and dangerous, a source of power, causing death and insanity in its wake. Over the course of the 10 available episodes, we've seen everything from emergency alert systems, to dashcam footage, weird induction tapes, perilous, peculiar footage of the skies, even the switchover from analog to digital television, putting Local 58 firmly in the modern day. Local 58 isn't finished, and videos seem to be coming out with infrequency, but I, among others, eagerly await to see where it's going. But, when the series was given attention by MatPat over on Film Theory, that's when it started to grow in popularity big time. All of a sudden, a huge viewer base had their eyes on analog horror, and with it came people doing the same. One of the new major players in the analog horror scene was Aiden Chick who created multiple series such as Channel 7, Analog Archives, and the popular anthology series of Evening Tide Media Center. Aiden Chick mastered analog horror pretty fast, and with widespread popularity of Analog Archives, even more content cropped up in its wake. 
Gemini Home Entertainment by Remy Abode was also incredibly popular, and having both an incredible grasp of the format, lots of clear dedication and care, even creating a video game that you can actually play. From there, the ball just kept rolling, with tons of different series starting up, and then, as if it wasn't popular enough, Scrimpus McGrimpus and Martin Wells created series like FNAF VHS and The Walton Files, respectively. And if there's one constant of the internet, it seems to be that FNAF is popular, so you can imagine the amazing reception these series both received. At its core, Analog Horror runs on a really simple idea. Found footage of old VHS tapes. Events and strange phenomenon that were caught on camera, archived, and saved. And the ideal of lulling you into a false sense of security before letting our viewer fall either abruptly or gently into realizing that this is not a safe program. You're watching something terrible and blasphemous, warped beyond comfort. This genre proliferated far and wide, with all sorts of creators jumping onto the trend, and then came one of the biggest and most prolific analog horror series out there, the Mandela Catalog. The popular series by Alex Kister, who uses Uncanny Valley and great editing to create an honestly very disturbing series that, in my personal opinion, is the best that analog horror has to offer. While it does forego many of the trends analog horror usually subscribes to, that's instead used to create an incredibly surreal, almost disorienting experience. And in turn, both Mandela Catalog's own popularity, and the popularity of things inspired by it, like the fan game Maple County, bolstered the fame even more. Analog horror is incredibly popular, with tons of thriving creators, plenty of variety in content, and in many ways, analog horror is something of an internet-born form of storytelling, with lots of life, longevity, prosperity to come. Analog horror has never been doing bad, 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 bad. Three minutes, 42 seconds. Like, what's up there? Hello everyone, Complete Indy here, and welcome. On today's programming, I'd like to take some time to talk about the fall of Analog Horror, a tale of repetition, shock factor, cliches, and proliferation. So sit back, relax, grab your snacks, and enjoy! There's a very special show come- Wait, haven't I said all this before? before, before? This was the very first episode of Local 58. Weather service, and one of its main components was the imitation of an emergency alert system broadcast for the weather update. This is a trend followed by Analog Archives in Amber Alert, Channel 7 in Storm Warning, Surreal Broadcast in 1989 Incident. The three of these are just a couple examples of alert systems being used in Analog Horror, and it's a trope that honestly has been used over and over to death. Analog horror, when done well, is terrifying, invoking feelings of dread and worry, or catching someone off guard. It can ease you into a feeling of nostalgia and comfort, only to plunge you deep into feelings of panic and discomfort, and some don't. The fact is, after MatPat and the rest of Film Theory introduced the wider public to the genre of analog horror, the attention it got, while amazing, beloved, could arguably be said to have done more harm than good. Analog Horror has overstayed its welcome, and with full respect to the creator, I think the perfect example of this is none other than... The Backrooms. But first, a quick word from our sponsors. In 2019, an anonymous user posted on 4chan's paranormal board asking for photos of eerie places. Someone shared this photo, and a reply with the following caption came after. If you're not careful, and you know clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old, moist carpet, the madness of mono-yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz, and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms trapped in. God save you if you hear something wander around nearby, because it sure as hell hurt you. People were instantly hooked on the back rooms, and it started to grow something of a fandom. In Kane Parsons, the creator revived a dying, already niche subgenre of subgenres of creepypasta, backrooms, and the liminal space popularity as a whole, into a full on analog horror sensation. And let me make it clear 
Kane is amazing. He is a true savant at horror. His background series creeps me out to no end. The 17-year-old is being hired to direct movies. He is an incredibly talented person. I am not just happy, but enthusiastically awaiting to see where his career takes him. But the backrooms have done the same thing as analog horror, and this junction is exactly where they meet. The backrooms were done to death. Everyone was making something or another about them. Many people grasped the concept well, but many others didn't. I do not believe in gatekeeping art, hell, one of my favorite pieces of art is arguably Felix Gonzalez Torres' pile of candy, but I do believe that many of these stories do need a bit more work, and there is a disproportionate amount of people posting low-quality work compared to high-quality work. Which would be fine, but it meant many others were losing interest in the format as it had grown stale. When King Parsons revived the backrooms, he revived it. And I believe he also revived Analog Horror with the exact same project. But now, both of them are growing stale. Tons of people attempt to mimic the backrooms without understanding what makes it scary, or realizing that at a certain point, something becomes too cliche to carry weight. Similarly, Local 58 is not done, but the series feels dormant, the rare occasional upload held together by hopes and dreams of its fans, and the diligent work of Chris Straub. Surreal Broadcast is waiting on its finale, no word of it, and a little part of me is worried it'll never be. Gemini Home Entertainment both feels dormant, and has had a rapid decline in popularity. Even the Five Nights at Freddy's end of the genre seems to be petering out, with the last major shred of it surviving in the form of FNAF Plus, a fan game officially endorsed by Scott Coffin. Tragically, people have lost interest in analog horror, which is a shame because this genre clearly has a lot of life to it still. Right? <sighs> Sadly, I wouldn't even go that far. Analog horror is great, but the amount of content directly copying Local 58 is hurting the genre more. It means people are becoming disillusioned of analog horror with the almost accurate but still misconception that if they've seen one, they've seen them all. Many people will watch one series, likely Local 58 or Mandela Catalog, and assume that everything else is a mimicry of those too. There's even a trend of people remaking analog horror. The creator Baddington had recreated almost all of Scrimpus McGrimpus FNAF VHS tapes to overwhelmingly good reception. Analog horror has stagnated. That's the core of the issue. Analog horror has homogenized, started repeating itself and becoming repetitive, people imitating whatever is popular despite it becoming a tired cliché. And in fact, those popular series like the Mandela Catalog have led to people imitating it more and more, its tropes of liquefied faces and even just having jump scares, which wasn't a super major component of analog horror prior, doesn't help the almost stigma that all analog horror is the same. And it's a shame, because this genre is wonderful, but at least we will have all the fond memories, the great series forever immortalized online. At least we can thank the creators. Can't we? Hello everyone, Complete Indy here, and welcome. On today's programming, I'd like to take some time to talk about the cancellation of analog horror. A tale of real-world actions, of sexual harassment, grooming, outrage, and of the end. So sit back. We've got a lot to talk about. This was the very last episode of Evening Tide Media Center. The series, created by Aiden Chick, who we discussed earlier as creating Channel 7, Analog Archives, and more... And to call Aiden Chick a big deal would be an understatement. In many ways, you can make the argument that he is even bigger to analog horror than Chris Straub was. So when at the end of Crimson Creek we get this... It's certainly horrifying to say the least. If you don't know what just happened, the episode ends with the supernatural alien-esque invasion of Crimson Creek University being covered up by the government with the false story of a school shooting. Many people were getting mad at Aiden Chick for crossing a line, saying that it was a bit too real a worry, a bit too far, while many others were on his side, saying it's not like a genre known as analog horror was meant to be warm and fuzzy. Personally, I think it could have been handled a bit more tactfully. Even Tide Media Center usually doesn't venture into this type of possibility, 
and I believe horror as a whole suffers from a lack of suitable content warnings. And before I hear that argument, Party Coffin's Welcome Home has a perfect example of good content warnings. It proves you can suitably warn your users in a horror experience without ruining the experience, but that's besides the point. Perhaps a and Chick should have settled for something less emotionally charged, or maybe he should have put a content warning to make it stand out as a problem. But that's what ifs. The fact is, Aiden Chick, in response to this controversy, took down every episode of Evening Tide Media Center, Analog Archives, and his entire Tempest universe, including Channel 7. He said he'd be leaving Analog Horror and the internet as a whole, and that he would start creating music under a pseudonym. And he was gone. Now, thanks to his stuff being on the internet, all of these analog horror series have ironically been properly archived by others, meaning we still have them. But with that, Aiden Chick, one of the originators to this genre, a staple name to its creators, was gone. And I really wish I could say, and with the people lost more interest at the end, but sadly things are worse than that. I have mentioned numerous times FNAF VHS by Scrimpus McGrimpus, as well as its copies by Baddington. Well, in April 2022, Baddington made an admittedly tasteless joke, heavily implying that fellow creator Martin Wells of Walton Files fame had died. It led to a fair bit of trouble, and Scrimpus even publicly revoked their permission for Baddington to make the FNAF VHS remakes. And while I believe that things were peacefully resolved between Martin and Baddington, and that they're still friends, which that would be amazing, I can't find any confirmation of this, but that does seem to be a good ending. And as for Scrimpus, in March of 2023, shortly after I started work on this video, a burner account from an unknown user in Scrimpus's private Discord posted, saying that Scrimpus had been sharing not safe for work fetish artwork with a 14 year old fan of theirs for years. Scrimpus themselves confirmed the accusation later that same day. I am going to skip over the obvious power imbalance here of taking advantage of a fan who looks up to you and knowing they won't report it because I don't need to explain why this is terrible. Nor will I explain why the fact this was happening to a minor is despicable. Or the fact that Scrimpus admitted to having adult-oriented spaces to safely and legally share this content in, and that they simply chose not to despite knowing it was wrong. The long and short of it, Scrimpus is a bad person. To be clear, to the words of everyone involved, Scrimpus's now former friends had no knowledge of this, and they shouldn't be judged. I'm also going to repeat the wishes of the victim to not make this into a big deal. It's been dealt with and resolved. There's no need to dredge this back up. I'm only covering it for informational purposes. But the fact remains, Scrimpus McGrimpus was effectively cancelled. And, well, ultimately, the fate of an obscure genre of internet horror is not even remotely important. The fact does remain that another pillar of the community was brought down. Between the departure of Aiden Chick and the crimes of Scrimpus McGrimpus, two of Analog Horror's biggest names, to be honest, I don't think I'm alone when I say it makes me not want to associate myself with the community. At a certain point, the community has become alienating. The mundane from elitist scaring new fans away, to the extreme and depraved, Analog Horror is less welcoming than ever. This genre has stagnated in what could have been its absolute greatest hour. Local 58, The Backrooms, Gemini, Mandela Catalog, all wonderful stories with captivated fans. Analog horror somehow fell further than ever. So, is that the note we end on? Well, no, actually. Local 58 isn't done, and while Alex Kister is, as of writing, taking a break from Mandela Catalog, he says he'll be back. We have those wonderful stories to look forward to, and despite Aiden Chick retiring, a channel called Evening Tide Valley's Restoration is claiming to take on the mantle, and continuing that tale. So let's end there, with the promise of maybe a reclamation of the genre, or for it to inspire a new wave of new creators. After all, series like Petscop, the game you'll never play, are still out there, and there's a world of creativity to be found in making new lost media. Just because this wave ended on a bad note, doesn't mean it always will. 
Even popular mainstream television like Doctor Who has taken their shot at a resurgence, having been off air for 20 years. If major television networks scared of profits and risk can revive the lost and forgotten, then why can't we? There's countless stories, and as long as we remember the past and vow never to repeat it, then why not keep going? Yes, there's stains on the past of analog horror. Yes, there's elitism that runs throughout the fans, a deeply rooted disease in the community. Yes, we have had bad creators, but everything has. We need to not let this define us. We need to learn from this, and we need to tell every tale we want, every story we think someone will want to hear. Because hey, it might not be good, but as long as you give it heart, we can revive analog horror again. Because yes, Analog horror is dead, and we killed it. But maybe someday the age-old horror trope of reviving the dead will prove true again. Until then, good night and good luck. Thank you for watching. This video has been a ton of work, and I hope you enjoyed. This video was made possible thanks to support on Patreon. Thank you to everyone who supported the channel, and if you want to support the channel, you can get access to early and exclusive content and be listed in the credits here. Use the link in the description and donate to your not-so-local community television. Every dollar counts! On top of that, thank you to the unspoken victims of my creative process, the people who had to tolerate me bouncing this script off of them. If you enjoyed, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing, and ring the little bell to be notified when new videos come out. You can check out these other videos, and until we meet again, we conclude our broadcast day.